Anybody need a handout? Yeah. Okay. You might leave, I don't know, a few, do you have a few, Meg, in case yeah. people come in? Yeah, okay. yeah. Great. So, um, there are various sections in this handout that I want to make sure I get to some of the latter sections. Uh, the beginning section is more directly about how various moral theories might be relevant to the problem of evil. But the first section I begin with is a version of the argument from evil I've given before. <clears throat> and it goes like this. If God exists, he would not allow excessive unnecessary suffering. But there is excessive unnecessary suffering, so God doesn't exist. This argument, I think, is better than some because I'm trying to phrase the first premise in ways that no theist, to which no theist will object. Um, there was, uh, I gave a, I wrote a paper in um, Dan Howard Snyder's book on the evidential argument from evil, and uh, Peter Van Inwagen responded saying that there could be basically unnecessary evil, but then the example he gave made me think, well, maybe there could, I'm still not convinced, but there couldn't be excessive unnecessary evil. And what I mean by uh, God couldn't allow uh, any excessive unnecessary suffering is that to be unnecessary, the allowing would be such that allowing it is not needed to bring about a greater good or prevent a greater evil. And the excessive just says there's way more of that sort of suffering than would be needed. There's, in other words, there's way more unnecessary suffering than you'd expect if God exists. And I want to focus the discussion on second premise. That, I think, is really what the evidential argument from evil is about, whether we have justification for believing it or not. I think the so-called logical problem of evil is really about the first premise. And Planning and others first started with some version that went, if God exists, there's no suffering. And then you could see how that isn't logically necessary. You can produce counterexamples, and it goes on. And so this is kind of a third version. Well, we'll try Rose version. If God exists, then he wouldn't allow any unnecessary suffering. And then I added excessive. Because as I say, I want to, maybe uh, people have criticisms of the first premise, but I'm trying to offer ones that everyone accepts and focus all the attention on the second premise about whether we're justified in believing it or not. And if the uh, theist says that the skeptical theist's basic uh, move is to say, well, we're not justified in believing there's excessive unnecessary suffering. And then I'm going to argue the overall view is I'm going to argue if, if they say that, then they're not going to have any answer to the young earthers who think that God created the world, the earth, or the universe, take your pick, really recently. 6,000 years ago, that's a creationist. The young earthers believe 100 years ago. Or there's this radical faction, the followers of Russell, the other Russell, it said it was created five minutes ago. And so I'm going to argue that whatever defense that the skeptical theist offers is going to be used by the young earthers to defend their view. But we know the young earthers' view is unjustified. And so, and it parallels in relevant respects the kind of response, uh, the kind of view the skeptical theist is going to offer. So if the young earthers uh, view and defense is not adequate, neither is the skeptical theists. So before I do that, I want to think about some attacks on, let's see, when did we actually start? Around 210. 210, OK. Some uh, possible attacks and defenses of the argument from evil. The first one is a, attack that somebody might start from a view of either moral or um, practical, a view of practical reason that's egoistic or a view of morality 
and say the first premise isn't necessarily true, that if either that moral or that um, practical view of practical reason is accurate, then it could be that God allows excessive unnecessary suffering. And so uh, it's an attack on the first premise. I think that ultimately it's not going to work because egoism is open to counterexample. So I imagine a case where uh, somebody is having a nice drink of some liquid, maybe they're just run and it's satisfying, it tastes good, uh, satisfies their thirst. But it's also the case that if you don't give, if he doesn't give that drink to some girl, she will die an agonizing death. And so I think contra the egoist, uh, she both has, he has both most reason to give the drink to the girl and it's the morally right thing to do. So Jim and I disagree about how to defeat egoism. Um, we, we think that egoism is not an adequate theory of practical reason, but Jim Sturber and I differ about whether you can defeat it. He thinks just by uh, charging and arguing that it begs the question. But I wonder whether we differ about what begging the question is. Uh, I don't, he says that if you, if the, prem, if the conclusion is explicitly or blatantly contained in the premises, you beg the question, but I think that's not sufficient. Here's an argument. John is a bachelor. If he's a bachelor, he's an unmarried male. Therefore, John is an unmarried male. The conclusion is explicitly and blatantly contained in the premises, but it need not beg the question if you already have reason to believe the premises. So my view is begging the question amounts to asserting a premise in an argument that needs justification, but none is given. So we differ about what just uh, begging the question is, and then whether whatever you take it to be, you can make this charge against the egoist. And I imagine the egoist responding, well, here I have an argument. First, it seems self-evident to me that what you have most reason to do is what's best for you. And secondly, it explains so many intuitions in cases. I have most reason to go to the hospital when I'm hurt. I have most reason to, to eat a certain diet, to exercise, to be nice to my friends and loved ones, to do what most people think is morally required. Because all those things in general are in my self-interest. They're best for me, and that's exactly what uh, egoism would say is why I've, I have reason to perform them. So I think that little argument would shift the burden of proof, at least, uh, the, to the people who are denying egoism. And then ultimately, they can only defeat it by giving some sort of counterexample. If you didn't like mine, you probably can think of better ones yourself. So we, Jim and I differ on this issue about how to defeat egoism. But in the end, this attempt by the egoist to attack the first premise in the argument, I think, fails because egoism fails for either one reason or another. The other attempt is to give a defense of the argument, and it basically is a kind of Kantian defense. And it says, um, well, if God allowed this suffering, all the suffering we see in the world that we can't understand why uh, an all-good, all-knowing, uh, all-powerful being would allow it, that uh, if he were to allow it, it would be for some other good or to prevent some other evil, maybe ones that we don't, we aren't even aware of. But this defense says, the principle that says you should never, that would be to use the people who are suffering in order to benefit others, say, that would be to use them as a mere means. And this principle interpreted this way says, it's never right to use somebody as a mere means. It's an exceptionalist principle that there's not enough good, there's never enough good or the prevention of evil, which could make it all things considered okay. And I argue against that, first by offering uh, Derek Parfit's example in On What Matters. He says that uh, it's sometimes morally permissible, even obligatory, to use somebody as a mere means. And he gives the example of an egoist who can save a drowning child, uh, but he won't do it unless the wealthy parents give him a bunch of money. And so he treats the child as a mere means to benefit him, his road to riches, as I say in my paper. And it seems like not only is that action 
morally permissible, it's morally obligatory. What else would he do? He shouldn't walk away and just let the little girl drown. And it's assumed, of course, he's the only one around who can save the girl, the parents can't swim, and so on and so forth. So then Parfit has another principle he calls the harmful means principle that he offers that says, oh, okay, but it's always wrong to harm or allow harm to occur to somebody as a means to help others. And that one um, doesn't condemn the ego's action because he doesn't actually harm the little girl, and so maybe it's a better candidate. And there are two examples, one given by Alistair Norcross and one by me, I use against this one. There's a famous case about that Philippa Foot gives, at least that's where I first encountered, about a fat man trapped in a cave, head pointed inwards. They were spelunkers. He backed out of the cave, got stuck in there. Unfortunately, there's water rising in the back of the cave. Uh, you're outside with a stick of dynamite. If nothing happens, all six will drown. If you blow the fat man free, he, of course, is going to die but the five will be saved. He's going to die anyway, of course. He will experience, on my little twist, slightly more suffering. He'll have slightly more suffering if you do that and than if he drowned had you done nothing. So you actually harm him. You're causing more suffering than if you just let him drown. But I think it would be morally permissible, hard to do, of course, psychologically, but morally permissible for you to blow the fat man free in that scenario I gave. Alistair Norcross gives a example where you, in order to distract a terrorist who's ready to detonate a bunch of bombs that will kill 10 million, 10 million people, you have to slap his child lightly and cause some unpleasantness to uh, distract the terrorist and then you can intervene and prevent this terrible act from occurring. And it looks like you're harming the child as a mere means to prevent this terrible act by the terrorist, but it looks to me intuitively in that case it's permissible, even obligatory. That's the only way to distract the terrorists. So if you get enough good being produced by at least inflicting some harm on another to produce this good for others, it seems sometimes it's permissible. So this defense doesn't work because then the theist can say, well, okay, I agree that if God allowed all this suffering we see in the world, uh, as a mere means, you can't conclude that it's all things considered wrong because maybe the, using those people as a mere means is the only way to achieve some great goods or prevent some great evils, even if they're ones we don't recognize or can't grasp, still that's a possibility that you haven't ruled out. So I think ultimately that defense doesn't work. Um, so then I want to go to uh, another sort of approach that Steve Weikstra has been pursuing of late, and I think it's the right kind of approach when it comes to trying to see whether we're justified in believing there's excessive unnecessary suffering or not. And the basic idea comes from science, and Steve gives an example, and there are other examples people often give of this sort, where you have some kind of core theory, and then in the light of maybe new observations or evidence, you supplement the core theory in order to account for that new evidence. So the example that Steve and Perrine give is about the wave theory of light. That's the core theory. And suppose initially there was a view of the ether through which light is supposedly travels according to this theory. And according to it, uh, light would have to tra travel in longitudinal waves, experiments then show that couldn't be the case. So you modify the theory and say, oh, well, the ether actually was of a different sort. And in that kind of ether, it could travel in tra transverse waves, and the observations don't account against it. And so the core theory stays, light is wave, light, light is, are waves, but then the supplementary theory is modified in light of new observations. And I remember reading, but I can't find it anymore, uh, when I was in, maybe not even graduate school, I'm not sure. Uh, Irving Copey gave an example about how the flat earthers can defend their view. There's a problem when you see ships sail away 
the, the bottom half of the ship disappears first on the horizon before the top. Well, the people who say the Earth is round can easily explain that. They, the roundness of the Earth will explain that phenomena, that uh, observation. But it's a little harder if you're a flat Earth person. Uh, and they have a saving hypothesis. You, light travels in these huge, shallow arcs. And if you get the, the light traveling in just the right kind of arcs, you will get the same result. So their saving hypothesis is no, light doesn't travel in straight uh, lines, it travels in these arcs, and we can then save the flat Earth hypothesis. Well, of course, this, I think, especially that last example, makes us think, huh, I wonder if there's a general requirement, though, on saving core theories by adding hypotheses, namely, isn't it a requirement that the hopefully saving hypothesis can't be one that you're justified in believing false? Some of you read my paper, and I was still working on this, and I had a stronger version. To save it, you have to be justified in believing the hypothesis is true. But I now think that's too strong. But this weaker one that I have in my handout, I think is right. You can't be justified in believing it's false and hope to save the core theory uh, when, it's, when the save, saving hypothesis, the candidate, uh, you're justified in believing it's false. So now I want to turn to things that Peter Van Inwagen says in his book on the problem of evil. And he says he's going to tell just so stories that for all we know are true. And he doesn't have this same purpose. I'm bending his purposes here and saying, well, what if you tried to use the little stories he tells as saving hypotheses? Would they meet the requirement? And I'm going to argue they wouldn't. But um, yeah, so, so that's the main point that, that I'm going to consider. Oh, it's because. Uh, Perrine and Steve say in one place, well, if they're saving hypotheses for theism, they'll be of this sort. They'll be about the fallenness of nature, the depravity of man, and the importance of free will, etc." And Van Inwagen's little stories fall into those kinds of categories. So I'm thinking they're possible representatives of that type of thing that you might use to save core theism. That's what motivates me to turn to them. So what's the little story? So it has various parts. So here's the first part. Van Inwagen says, for all we know, God at some point in history created a miracle and caused our primate ancestors to become rational. They either also had or caused them to have preternatural powers. What, like what? They had the power to stop a wild beast with a look. They had the power to cure with a touch. And they had the power to foresee the future so they could get out of the way of natural disasters like earthquakes. When they got rationality, I assume they got free will. Unfortunately, due to the egoistic genes they inherited from their ancestors, they misused their free will and did bad things. This caused them to be separated from God. And then things went badly. And then people, not only those who exercised their free will and rebelled and were separated from God, but even the innocents, their children, their children's children, and so forth, were creatures of chance. They would get killed and harmed. But that's what happens when, when man falls. And why didn't God stop it? The answer is, 
because what he wants is people to freely return to him and be in union with him and he couldn't cause them to do that that would not be there freely returning so he had to nudge them in that direction and the only way they could nudge him is making things so bad including the suffering of innocence so that that would encourage them without causing them to re freely return to God. That is sort of the plan of redemption. How are you going to return to overcome the separation? That's the story. I think that all three parts of that story are false and we're justified in believing they're false. I think we're justified in believing that there was not an event like a miraculous intervention where rationality and free will were caused. It's possible, logically possible, but what's at issue here is are we justified in believing it's false or not? I think we are, and I think we're justified in thinking no creatures had preternatural powers and then lost them, because according to evolutionary theory, A, this kind of sudden change doesn't usually occur. It usually occurs gradually, so it's implausible that it occurred all at once. It's very implausible that creatures had these powers and lost them because they seem really advantageous. Secondly, would a holy good being allow the innocents to suffer just because some of their ancestors or even the current generation they did something wrong. That doesn't seem morally plausible. It doesn't seem like just because I have done something wrong that my children should suffer. And if you try to save the view with some kind of doctrine of original sin, I think that then that's not going to even that's not going to make sense either because intuitively we think people aren't guilty, the children aren't guilty just because I did something wrong. So I think it's morally implausible that a whole holy good being, etc., would allow this. And thirdly, I think it's implausible from a standpoint of um, human psychology that if you, if you have a family and some the children are somehow estranged from the parents, it doesn't make sense that in order to get the children to come back into the family or having a relation with the parents that you ought to allow them to suffer and their children when you could intervene. It's more likely that they would return to you if you treated them kindly and were, you know, bene benefited them when you could and so on and so forth and that you'd let them suffer in ways either that they understood or didn't understand but with the belief that you could have intervened if you wanted. So the three parts of that story I think are all unjustified. That is, on the basis of evolution, the so, sort of evo uh, the miracle and the loss of preternatural powers, the claim that it's morally okay for God to use that plan to get people to return to Him, and thirdly, that it's a plausible, psychologically plausible plan to get uh, Him to uh, people to return and to end the separation from God. Now, um, that I think is an example of a supplementary hypothesis that is falsifiable, but falsified. That is, one that's falsifiable, but we're justified in believing is false. There are other kinds of hypotheses that I think suffer from being unfalsifiable. So, Steve and, and uh, as Laura pointed out, it reminded me actually this morning about Alston and his paper in the Howard Snyder volume, give this kind of uh, response to the atheist. They say there are three things you don't know and you, sh you must in order to make, to justify your claim that there's excessive unnecessary suffering. First, you'd have to know what all the goods and bads are, 
not just the ones we're aware of, but all the goods and bads that there might be, especially if there's a God. Second, you'd have to know the relative weights, either that God or, if you don't believe in God, just objectively, those goods and bads have. Does this one outweigh that one? Does, does it not? And that. And third, you'd have to know what role they play in the actual world. That is, maybe all that suffering that seems to us, knowing just some of the goods and bads, seems to us excessive and unnecessary, all of it in the actual world, isn't really excessive and unnecessary if we really understood the connection between those allowings and those goods or prevention of bads, we then see, as we now don't, that they were actually necessary. So you need to know all of those kinds of three kinds of things in order to be justified in believing the suffering we see is excessive and unnecessary. And you don't. So this reminded me and made me think of an old exchange between Flu, Hare, not that Hare, <laughs> and Mitchell. And in that exchange, they all tell a little story. And, and uh, Flu's story is about somebody who believes there's a gardener who tends this plot in the jungle where many flowers and many weeds are growing. And one person has the belief that there's a gardener who tends, maybe not so well, this plot. So they say, OK, well, let's put up, I don't think this is the original version, I'm doing this, let's put up cameras and we'll look and let them run and see if any gardener comes to tend the plot. They do? No, nothing is seen on the cameras. The defender of the gardener view says, uh, well, actually it's an invisible gardener. But we say to him, but uh, I guess we could touch or smell the guy. <laughs> and so they put up various wires or whatnot, so the trip wires, so that if he went into the garden, it would trip the wires and there'd be a signal that somebody entered there. And they, put bloodhounds around the plot and they would bark if they smelled him. They do that and there's no evidence of an invisible or uh, uh, there's no <laughs> evidence of a visible or smellable gardener. And then the, the defender of the gardener view says, well, there's a gardener, but he's invisible. Uh, he's untouchable, intangible, I guess. And you can't smell them, and you can't hear them, but there's a gardener. That is supposed to be a hypothesis that's unfalsifiable. Flu, being in the grips of positivism, said that is a meaningless claim. I don't say that. I think it's a meaningful claim. I think we're unjustified in believing it. I think positivists had a lot of good points. They just didn't apply them to the right thing. They had points that really were epistemically relevant. They thought that they were relevant to whether claims were meaningful or not. So I worry that the hypothesis you says you have to know all of the goods and bads, you'd have to know all of the goods and bads, what their weight is and how they actually relate in the actual world, is a standard that can't be met and is so as like but then the claim is, if you can't meet it, then you can't be justified in believing that there uh, is excessive, unnecessary suffering. But on the analogy with what Flu says, I think you could be justified in believing it, just because the hypothesis it offered is unfalsifiable. And there's lots of reasons for the one that's falsifiable, the ones, to think they're false. There's another version in this flu hair mitchell debate that um, Mitchell gives, and he imagines there's a stranger that comes at night and talks to him for the whole night, and then at the end says he grows to trust him, and he, at the end he's, 
the stranger tells him, look, you'll see me doing things sometimes that look like I'm betraying the resistance, but I'm not. Trust me, you know, and he leaves. And then they observe, the partisan who had the conversation with him observes that indeed sometimes he helps the resistance, sometimes the partisan himself asks for help and he receives it, sometimes he doesn't, sometimes the stranger is seen turning in his patriots to the, to the occupied force, and so forth. And I think Mitchell's point is, but his trust in the stranger would be rational or justified. Whether or not that's true, I want to say it's in a couple ways disanalogous from the situation with God. First off, the stranger is finite, so we can understand how maybe sometimes he would have to turn in the uh, patriots in order to, to get more trust from the occupied forces in order to do, to undercut them even further. So given his finitude, we could understand there's a kind of saving hypothesis that makes sense here why he would do what he does. But there's not going to be that kind of saving hypothesis in the case of God who has infinite power. Secondly, the stranger, uh, sorry, the partisan in this story has had personal experience, a personal encounter with the stranger. Now maybe some religious people have, but many people have not had comparable experiences with God or some uh, supernatural power, and that makes it disanalogous. Whether anyone has had, this is a long discussion about whether that's the best interpretation of their experiences that they take to be encounters with God or not, but in any case, a lot of people, that will be a disanalogous feature. Now, on my handout, I'm at uh, just before uh, Roman numeral four, I say things that I don't think are really kind of the disanalogous features, the things that I call three and four, I, 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 and one V. Uh, I want to bring up, and I, on reflection, I think probably they're not disanalogous features, but I do want to point out uh, that it would not, if there's enough evidence that the stranger keeps betraying the resistance, even though the friends grant that if he is on our side, and he's finite, he will do some of these things. They grant that conditional, but if enough evidence comes in, it would be reasonable for them to believe, but he's not on our side. I say that because there are conditionals that Steve and other people talk about that may be true, but I want to say that even if they are, evidence may be sufficient that it could make it rational to believe that there, there isn't a God who's uh, allowing this, all of this suffering for a purpose, even though you grant if there were a God, uh, he would allow these things to happen and we wouldn't be able to see why they were being allowed. The last part, the part about four, Steve, I think, is rightly worried about people like Paul Draper kind of uh, selecting the data. Draper and I sort of bring out hard cases, you know, a little girl in Flint who's brutally raped, uh, beaten, and then strangled to death in Flint way back when, when I started thinking about this uh, problem, I, I just went through the Detroit Free Press and found examples. I found later ones about a little girl more recently who was uh, drowned by her parents. They poured water down her throat because she wasn't eating properly. Then they coached the kids, the other kids, for an hour to take the fall to say that they did it. And then, then they called the police, I think. Well, it didn't work. They actually convicted him. But actually, the person, whoever it was that raped, beat, and then killed the little girl in Flint actually got off in trial because the lawyer argued that they hadn't proven that it wasn't the Room, the rumor, they had also had a rumor in the house who did it. And so he cast doubt on whether the boyfriend did it. So he actually went off scot-free. But in any case, there are, there are these kinds of cases. And is, isn't it kind of unfair for the atheist to pick these cases and not look at the total evidence? You know, in any kind of case, like if you're at a jury trial 
and you just looked at some of the evidence and then said the guy's guilty, that wouldn't be right. You should look at the total evidence. That's what that's a requirement of of justification. You have to be justified relative to the total evidence in in holding whatever hypothesis you hold. I agree. That that seems like it's unfair. Now I'll give this Smokey the Bear example. So Smokey's got to be maybe more powerful than a regular Smokey, but I was going to give, I gave this talk to my class a couple days ago, and I said, you want me to sing the Smokey the Bear song? But they said no, so I won't. <laughs> they know I sing. Well, anyway, so Smokey the Bear is that he's against fires. And we see this forest fire, and we think, well, if there were Smokey, he would step in and stop it. But it hasn't been stopped. Now, you might think, well, maybe he wouldn't because some forest fires are such that if they burn, it actually does better for the forest in the long run. It, you know, rejuvenates, uh, flourishes because there was a fire. But suppose we, we know about this fire. There's, it's the kind of fire we've seen many times in the past that when this kind of fire happens, nothing grows back. It doesn't, it's not really good for the forest. So we can't see, as far as we know, it's, you know, not doing any good. I'm assuming Smokey's good. That is, he good in the sense he's against fires, <laughs> and he's against you know destroying the environment by fire. Let's say, put it that way. Now, if you had one of those, maybe a couple of them, then I would think it'd be enough to undercut the hypothesis that Smokey is is always against fires. Even if you had other forest fires where they started and you noticed that a sudden burst of rain came in, a downpour, and doused the fire before it could get going. It prevented it. And you had others where you saw there were fires, and they burned, but actually it was really good for the forest in the long run. Even if you saw, saw all those things, you might think there's a Smokey, and sometimes he lets fires happen for the good of the forest. Sometimes he puts them out with downpours. But I think still, this fire, maybe a couple more, wouldn't justify you any longer in believing there's a Smokey who's always against fires. It, ones, you know, because here I hypothesize that it's not going, he didn't put it out, and it's not going to really help the forest. My real move that I've made in the past uh, which I think is important, is to compare what the young earthers are going to say using the same kind of defense that the skeptical theist employs. And so I don't say on my hand it was a mistake that I didn't say everything, but I let y equal the hypothesis that I didn't put this in. There is a God who created the earth or the, or the universe recently, a hundred years ago, I'd say, just to pick a time. And they're going to say that view might look bad given all the fossils and the deep river valleys and all that stuff I cited earlier. But wait, we have a saving hypothesis that we're going to link with our basic core young earthism. And that hypothesis is it's better to have a hundred year old universe where people can learn the lessons of history and natural history by apparent history rather than the actual history. Because the apparent history won't involve real suffering, whereas the actual history would. And everything from, from this is the standard view. It's a long, long time, you know, 14 billion years or something like that for the universe. And here's the young earther's view, of course this is too small, but the young earther's view from here on out, it goes just like the uh, regular view. Now somebody might say, okay, so I quote uh, Van Inwagen here, I say, this is on page, well the one that says Roman numeral four quote from Van Inwagen, but it seems clear that a world in which horrible things occurred only in nightmares, that's his italics, would be better than a world in which the same things occurred in reality. And that a morally perfect being would, 
all other things being equal, prefer a world in which horrible things were confined to dreams to a world in which they existed in reality. And of course he's going to say, yeah, but other things aren't equal. So there are two things he'll say. One is massive, irregular, <clears throat> massive irregularity is uh, not good and so that this other things aren't equal and this world would contain massive irregularity. So massive irregularity exists in this world and it's a problem. I deny both of those things. I don't think there's massive irregularity. There's the same kind of regularity in the laws. They just start roughly 14 billion years later, rounding off from the 100. There's not massive irregularity, and even if there were that kind of massive irregularity of some sort, it's not a bad thing. Why? Because people can plan and do things and so forth from then on out the same way that they could in all the previous history according to the sort of standard view about the age of the universe or the Earth. So I deny that massive irregularity exists, and if, even if it does in some sense, it's not a bad thing. Furthermore, if it's a bad thing, it's much better than having these millions and millions of years of the suffering of innocent animals and people. He also says, uh, massive deception is contrary to the nature of a perfect being. I'm on the back of that page now. Van Inwan claims massive deception is inconsistent with the nature of a perfect being. I don't believe that either. Here's an example. You're in Nazi Germany and you can massively deceive the Nazis by hiding Jews in an underground city and when they come and ask are you hiding Jews you tell them no and they believe you. And it's massive. There's lots of people underground, thousands of Jews. I think that massive deception is not wrong. In fact, I think it's obligatory if you can, at least if you can, maybe it's not necessary, but at least if you know you can get away with it and not be punished. Well, surely God can get away with massive deception and not be punished. And if it's not wrong, in this example I gave, I don't see why it would be wrong if a perfect being would massively deceive for some good ends comparable to the good ends of saving the thousands of Jews. So I don't think that either of those things are true. Now what's the main point of this? There's some kind of nature of the saving hypothesis about you have to know all the goods and their weight and blah, 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 and the young earthers hypothesis. The young earthers save their view by introducing what I call H2 here, the hypothesis basically, that it's better to have a short, a rather recently created universe without all the suffering rather than one that has all the suffering from a long time ago. And uh, you can learn the lessons just as well from this, in this universe as you can in that one. So I say they have a saving hypothesis that is as good as the saving hypothesis that I've heard from the theists that aren't uh, unfalsifiable ones. And so that view, according to the skeptical theist's own reasoning, the young earthers must have a good view. I think intuitively we think that can't be right that the, that view, naturalistic standard scientific view, is, is we're more justified in accepting it than the young earth hypothesis. But why? Well, I don't have a complete theory of what's the best explanation. I think the standard one's the better explanation. But whatever it is, there's something in the young earth hypothesis that makes it not as good an explanation as the standard one. And it's the very same things that are in the theistic saving hypothesis that makes me say they're no better than the young earthers. So when you compare the theistic hypothesis to uh, the naturalistic view that says there is no reason, the reason why there, it appears that there's excessive necessary suffering, if you do it that way, or just the reason there is so much suffering, forget about appearing, is because, okay, here's the crude version of the naturalistic 
hypothesis, shit happens. <laughs> things happen, you know? What do you think? There's nobody watching over things so that, you know, earthquakes occur, bad people are, are born and, and raised to be in their, I don't know, their genetics and their environment causes them to be bad and they do bad things and so forth. So that doesn't have all of the other things that the young earth hypothesis has in it. There's a God in young earth hypothesis. He works in mysterious ways. He has these reasons we can't really grasp, but he makes the world, uh, all the signs of age in the world for reasons beyond our can. And if you ask me what particular reasons, then I give you the, the hypothesis about it's better to have a 100 year than a 14 billion year universe with all the suffering avoided. There's one more. So I, I, you get the point that I'm trying to say there. You have to treat the young earth hypothesis as comparable with the saving hypotheses that the theist offers. And they go bad in one or two ways. The, the supplementary hypothesis either are like Van Inwagen's, they're falsifiable but false, or they're unfalsifiable. And either way, you don't have a hypothesis you're justified in believing. That doesn't mean it's not possible for the skeptical theist to come to get a hypothesis that's both uh, falsifiable and I can't claim you're justified in believing it's false. So it's a kind of burden shifting argument as the most I have here that, well, okay, I tried these two. You, you see what you have to come up with in order to avoid the objections I've raised. My final section is about the G.E. Moore shift. Um, there are famous skeptical arguments that go you know, something like, if, if I know I have a hand, then I have to refute all those skeptical hypotheses that say that I'm a handless being deceived by an evil demon, I'm a handless brain in a vat, uh, uh, all those kinds of, I'm a handless in the matrix, things like that. Uh, how do you, but I'm being deceived by having all of these same experiences as if I were in the real world. So. It goes, if, you're, if you know you have a hand, then you can refute those skeptical hypotheses, but you can't refute them, so you don't know you have a hand. Moore did the GE Moore shift. I agree with the first premise, he said. I, if you, I know I have a hand, then I can refute those skeptical hypotheses. Hey, I know I have a hand, and so I can refute the skeptical hypothesis. Well, the theists might try that. I agree with you, Bruce, they might say. If God exists, there's no excessive unnecessary suffering. God exists, so there really is no excessive unnecessary suffering. So there are lots of arguments, of course, for God's existence. But I want to, because I'm here at Notre Dame, I want to consider Planiga's argument from the census divinitatis and his theory of warrant that he might give. So warrant is, according to Planiga, what you need to add to true belief to get knowledge. And so what conditions have to be Matt, now let me go to my handout, back to my handout. Um, I'm on the bottom of the, next to the last page. A belief has warrant for me, says Planiga, if one, it has been produced in me by cognitive faculties that are working properly, function is as they ought, sub subject to no cognitive dysfunction, in a cognitive environment that's appropriate for mind kinds of cognitive faculties. Second, the segment of the design plan governing production of belief is aimed at the production of true beliefs, not at survival or something like that. Three, there's a high statistical probability that a belief produced under these conditions will be true. That's a reliability condition. And four, I just add four. He says at this point in the book, these are necessary conditions. He doesn't say what's needed, but I'm looking at the kind of discussion that precedes that to infer what he might mean. A fourth condition, I say no defeaters. I, I'm not sure about that, but I'm taking four and the other three to be sufficient for warrant for Planiga. He might then argue we have a census divinitatis whose aim, whose aim is to produce true beliefs about propositions that entail God exists. It sometimes functions properly in some people in appropriate cognitive environments where it's reliable and causes people to believe such things as God created that when looking at a flower or a sunset or snow-capped mountains, and suppose there are no defeaters, then it follows these people are in this situation are warranted in believing that God created these things and by simple inference that God exists. I think that 
you would be justified in believing that conclusion only if you were justified in believing first. We have a census divinitatis. I don't know if they were here, but some people might, oh, we have a census leprechaunitis. I figured it's Notre Dame if anywhere, or a census gremlinitis, and that it, it has the same kind of features as the census divinitatis, but it actually puts you, uh, gives you warrant for believing things about gremlins and leprechauns. But if you didn't have reason to believe we had those kind of senses, that argument would get you nowhere. So I think you have to have justification for believing the second, the premise about having a census divinitatis before you'd be justified in believing the conclusion. But even worse, I think, uh, is I think Plantinga's theory is false. There's an example I call True North that I created because of some objections to similar examples. So I'll go back. Norman's a famous case uh, offered by Bonjour. Norman's a person who has clairvoyant powers, but he's ne he doesn't know it. He's never confirmed his powers. One day he has a vision of the president in New York, and on that basis forms the belief the president's in New York. He seems like he's unjustified and doesn't know that insofar as he doesn't have any confirmation of his reliable belief-producing faculty. People have said, however, but they're defeaters. Shouldn't Norman think, geez, what's happening here? I've got these visions. What did somebody slip into my drink last night? Or I must be getting too little sleep or something like that. How come other people don't have these experiences? So they're defeaters. So I, here's True North. I constructed it to avoid the charge of a defeater. True North has an internal compass, so to speak, that you can blindfold True North spin them around and leave the blindfold on and ask him what's north, what's south, what's north, he can do all the directions, and he will get it right every time. But like Norman, he has no confirmation of his uh, compass ability, his directional abilities. And he doesn't have defeaters because he just thinks everybody has this. It's not surprising to him. You know, it's not like a hallucination. He thinks everybody has it, but nobody's ever you know, said to him, oh yeah, we, we tell north, south, east, west the same way. In fact, maybe they don't have this ability, but he thinks he's not unusual and that he has it. And so there are no defeaters. And then any reason to think the Norman case, the person uh, on our theory, say our reliableist plus theory, doesn't know or is not justified in believing the presence in New York are undercut by the way I describe this example. All the defeaters are gone, and then the intuition that drove the Norman case before defeaters were considered was this kind of hidden reliability with no confer confirmation of it. It doesn't confer justification. It doesn't confer warrant, because if it did confer warrant, uh, true North would know that's North, even though he's never confirmed his compass abilities. So um, I think that attempt to, to pull a GE Moore shift by the kind of Plantinga route uh, is unsuccessful. Of course, that doesn't mean that somebody couldn't give another argument for the existence of God, but I was just suggesting one that probably some of you are convinced of his theory of warrant uh, might doubt then. So where, what should we conclude uh, after all this? Well, I think my, we should conclude that the problem of evil is a sound argument that provides adequate reason to believe in the existence uh, to disbelieve in the existence of an all-knowing, all-powerful, holy, good being. That is stated, it does not count against the existence of a being who lacks at least one of these three attributes. That's actually why my Smokey story said, well, I don't think you can consider Smokey completely against or good completely against fires, even though there might be other reasons to think there's a uh, not wholly good Smokey. And while I do think that there are sound arguments for the existence, I don't think there are sound arguments for the existence of an even lesser supernatural being, that issue isn't taken up there. Here, you might think that there's arguments for a God who lacks one of these, at least one of these three attributes. Well, that's another talk. Thanks. Thank you. Jim had some comments to lead off the discussion.
Thanks very much, Chris. Bruce realizes that both sides in the debate over the problem of evil need to counter the egoist. Bruce thinks he can do that by offering an intuitive counterexample, and he shuns any need to offer a non-question-begging argument against egoism. But the counterexample he offers will not even require libertarians who accept morality to help the person in need, let alone move egoists to do so. Moreover, when counterexamples do work, as in the case of Gettier-type counterexamples, there's a shared, we might say, a non-question-begging background that helps explain why they work. So the two approaches here to defeating egoism, intuitive counterexamples and non-question-begging argument, are not unrelated. Bruce also thinks that he cannot use principles like the ends do not justify the means, or that one should never do evil that good may come of it, to help solve the problem of evil because such principles all, all permit exceptions. Bruce gives us the case of the large spelunker stuck in the mouth of the cave where five other spelunkers are trapped and flood waters are rising. Here, Bruce thinks it would be justified to use a stick of dynamite to blow the large person out of the mouth of the cave, even though such an action would would, would conflict with both the Kantian principle that the end does not justify the means and the Pauline principle will never do evil that good may come of it. Bruce just thinks there are justified exceptions to these principles. That seems right. But notice the exceptions that Bruce cites are for persons like ourselves, who are limited in power. For God, there would be no exceptions based on limitations of power. That would make a difference. Finally, with respect to Bruce's challenge to the auxiliary premises that theists may introduce into their basic theism with the goal of better showing God's compatibility with the moral evil of the world, Bruce specifically criticizes Peter Van Inwagen's proposed theodicy for, among other things, being compatible with evolutionary theory. But then Bruce goes on to claim that theists have no more reason to accept their specific forms of theism than, do, than they do to accept young earthism with its claim that the world is just 100 years old. But young earthism, irrespective of whatever moral or cognitive advantages it might have, is clearly inconsistent with Christian doctrines of incarnation and redemption. Surely that would give Christian theists grounds to weigh the options differently. It does not make sense uh, if, if it does not make sense to expand basic theism so that it contradicts evolutionary theory, as Bruce argues, then it also does not make sense to expand basic theism so that it contradicts the most fundamental doctrines of Christianity. Thanks, Jim. Uh, I think uh, there are a lot of people here, so if I respond to Jim, I think you all have enough time to to ask questions yourselves. Um, so on the first point about counterexamples, it is a deep difference that Jim and I have about this that I don't think that people have to uh, share some background in order for a counterexample to be telling. It may be necessary if they're going to change their views, they won't unless they share a background. But as far as the epistemic force of the counterexample, I don't think that's a requirement. And in particular, if you think about Gettier examples, I don't think people shared a background that was compatible with the Gettier examples. They all thought that knowledge was justified true belief. But despite that, this, these examples came along. And not all of them are accepted. But some, one, I'll go more into it if you want, but there's one called Sheep that Chisholm and, and um, Beeler have all sort of developed where Almost everyone agrees, except for a while, Brian Weatherson, that, that those were counterexamples to justify true belief as knowledge, despite the fact that people came into the discussion thinking justify true belief as knowledge. So I don't think it requires the, the epistemic success of a counterexample does not require a shared background. Even if people don't change their mind, those examples, I think, clearly count again, JTB as being sufficient for knowledge. Um, it's a good point that Jim makes about my examples is for exceptions to the 
uh, you shouldn't treat a person as a mere means or the Pauline principle. It seems like it only applies, the ones examples I gave apply to people like us who have limited power or we're finite and it doesn't, uh, somebody might say, but it doesn't apply to God. It only applies, the exceptions that is, only apply to people who are finite like us. And maybe so, and then maybe if the principle did apply to uh, um, God, exception, without exception, then I think, of course, what the skeptical theist is going to say is, yes, we say that uh, there can't be, just roughly, any unnecessary suffering, and there isn't. At least you're not justified in believing there is. And so then they, they focus in on the epistemic point, accepting the exceptionalist principle, and digging in at another place. The last one about you know, I say that uh, Van Inwagen's uh, little stories are not justified, and I introduce evolutionary theory and, and say uh, that's why they're not. And then uh, I say that the young earthers believing the universe is, or whatever, universe is 100 years old. That would say, Jim says, be incompatible with Christian's doctrine of incarnation and redemption. And suppose I just grant that's true, and I say, okay, the young earthers have to be non-Christian theists. Um, but then I think I can still make my main point, because even as non-Christian theists, don't you think that young earthism interpreted that way? There's something wrong with it. That is, it's not the hypothesis to accept given these two competitors, whether it's Christian or not. And so why isn't it? Then the question is, why isn't it uh, the one to accept? And then I think that those analogies with the saving hypotheses of the skeptical theist still obtain. There's this God who works in mysterious ways. We don't exactly know how he interacts with the universe or why he does things or why he makes the world look older than it is. And all those kinds of mystery are introduced in both the young earthers hypothesis and the skeptical theist hypotheses, at least on the version that I think are the ones that are basically impossible to refute. And that's the crucial parallel between the two hypotheses, young earthism and skeptical theism on aversion, that makes me say, if you hold that the one's unjustified, you have to hold that the other is regardless of whether young earthism is compatible with Christianity or not. Those are my responses to Jim. Do you want me to? Please, would you keep, keep track? Going. I kind of lose track if okay. I'm doing two uh, things at once. I assume there's no undergraduates. We were supposed to <laughs> let them go first, but no offense, looking around. <laughs> seems there or not. Uh, so, who's, yeah? Um. Yeah. The stuff at the end, uh, what non-circular confirmation do I have that my sense faculties are reliable? And if the answer is the deliverance of some other faculty, what non-circular confirmation do I have that that is reliable? I don't think I have a non-circular one. I just think, like, generally that I think the best explanation that our sense uh, faculties are reliable is we've had a whole bunch of experiences that include uh, kind of connection with others, uh, you know, we see things and feel things and other people say, oh yeah, they're there too, and blah, 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 and it's all that totality of data, I think is the reason why we ought to trust, say, our vision or our touch or whatever. But I don't see in the case of True North that there's any comparable data that would justify him. I can imagine he could get it, of course, but I don't see that there is. So it's just consistency? Say that again? It's just consistency? It's not just result. consistency, no, because I think what the best explanation of all of this agreement between our senses and agreement between me and you about whether there's a, like. I'll stop talking. Whether, whether there's agreement between me and other people's senses requires me presupposing the reliability of my own senses, obviously. I don't know, I just take this data you say, that's all I take. You say blah, blah. I say you see a desk, you say yeah. That's the data, what you say, what I, my experiences, and then the best explanation of all that data doesn't presuppose anything. It's finally at the end, 
that the best explanation is, huh, he's, he said that and blah, blah, and the best explanation is that there must be a lector in her here that ultimately made him look at it, see it, and say this when I asked him and why I think there's one. Um, okay, so I'm going to give uh, four reasons why the young Earth uh, is, is not better um, okay. than, uh, than our world. Um, I had five, but Jim took one of them. <laughs> so, okay, so first, first reason. Um, there are fewer people in that world, um, and it's valuable. God would want to create more people because, uh, um, like, for platitudinous reasons, he wants to um, share his love with as many people as possible. Um, so there would be less value for that reason. So that's one reason. Um, another reason, um, you might think that there's a relevant moral difference between doing evil and allowing evil. Um, and in that world, God would, it seemed, not just be allowing um, evils, but he would be actively deceiving in creating people, um, like with false memories um, and this kind of thing. And so you might think that that's relevantly, that that like, tips the moral scales more than, okay. uh, than allowing evil in this world. Um, and then the, uh, the third and fourth reasons um, have to do with, the, it seems to me that the hypothesis is pragmatically self-refuting in a way that uh, um, the skeptical theist hypothesis is not. Um, mm -hmm. So I suppose that uh, we're wise, the young earth hypothesis. hypothesis. Um, somebody making that hypothesis, it seems, um, is pragmatically committed to it being, they're being justified in believing that that, that hypothesis is true. Mm -hmm. um, but if uh, you're justified in believing why, um, part of what Y said was that uh, it's necessary for us to have this apparent past for us to learn from, uh, yeah. like from from um, what we take people to have done in the past. Right. But then when I realized, because I just came to learn why, oh, this past wasn't real, then it seems that it's going to lose that motivational effect. Okay. Uh, if if this um, if it's being apparent was part of the uh, what was doing the motivation. Right. Um, and then similarly, um, this is the fourth one. Uh, in terms of making plans in the world, uh, which, which you mentioned on the handout, um, if I come to be convinced that God uh, is massively deceiving us about what happened in the past, then that seems to, it would make me more confident that he's going to massively deceive us in the future. Um, and so I would be less sure that when I go around trying to bring about good things that <laughs> okay, yeah. my actions are actually going to have the intended effects. I got you. Okay, see if I can remember. You'll have to help me if I can't remember all those. Okay, first the more, isn't it better to have more rather than fewer? The answer to that is no. Uh, Parfit has this argument in Reasons and Persons about, uh, he calls it the uh, repugnant conclusion that says, mm. you know, basically, if we produce more people that were just, here's just barely happy, you know, and we produce enough of those people, you know, according to utilitarianism, that would be better than having a world, you know, with, where people, fewer people, but they're better off. Well, I do take that to be a repugnant conclusion. I don't think that actually having more, so you have a total amount of more happiness, actually makes the world better. It's very funny. My wife and I argue about uh, uh, veganism. And I say, well, look, you, can't, you really can't defeat the arguments for veganism. And she says, yes, I can. Because if people didn't eat meat, there wouldn't be as many animals around. I said, no, wait. OK, I'm going to grant you that. but." Don't you grant me? We have animals on our farm, and we just like them as pets. And people would still have animals. And the fact that there are more animals around doesn't doesn't give you a reason to to eat meat, you know. Or you know, it, it's not a reason just because you had more. I don't think more just because you have more it makes it therefore either better or certainly not morally obligatory. The other one about doing allowing. I I only have a job at Wayne State because I wrote a essay way back in, I don't know, the 19th century that said, <laughs> and it's called On the Relative Strictness of Negative and Positive Duties, in which I argued that there is no moral difference when you hold other things equal between doing and allowing. And so I give the example, I think I gave it maybe to John at lunch about, you know, there's, there's transplant where you cut somebody up and take his organs and save the five. And then I, I introduced my classes, one I called chicken bone. And so now you're in transplant, you're the surgeon, and you're operating on this guy who's in for some minor surgery. And you just, whoops, slip, and then it causes an artery to burst, and the guy dies, and you get, get his organs, and you save the five. And this one, the guy, you and the guy go down to the cafeteria for lunch, and he orders chicken for lunch, 
And being a vegan, you think you should choke. No, that's not part of the story. <laughs> the story goes, and he chokes on the chicken bone. And you could easily perform the Heimlich maneuver. But you think, aha, if that guy dies, then I will uh, get five organs and save the five. I think those two examples are morally on a par, but one is doing and one is allowing. Um, you have to remind me three and four. So the, the third and fourth were with the self-refuting worry. Yeah, self-refuting. Uh, when you come to believe this, then it'll, uh, it'll undermine <coughs> the purpose that it was made for. Yeah. And so now, of course, we young earthers have to modify some more. So we say, well, you know, and the hypothesis is that God pr produced all of this you know, fake history so we could learn the lessons, but he actually produced a story that he believed represents the real world when it comes into existence. It's like somebody reading a novel from which you can learn lessons. And let's suppose you, you have reasons you think, to, at least the theory says, to trust the author. So that's our view. We trust the author. It was <coughs> just a story. And now we see there's other people, of course, who will work on because they don't see this. But for us, that's the problem for me uh, that holds this view. And so now we tell this extra story. It says, it was a narrative. It was a fiction, and it was a moral narrative to teach us, without actually having suffering, how things are going to go. And we don't have any reason to distrust God, because we have reason to think that the story he told actually does represent how the world will go in the future if we don't be careful so we don't do x, y, and z that cause the holocaust and the blah, blah, <coughs> and the blah. So it's not self-refuting. And what's the fourth one? Uh, so the fourth one, then, was that if I think God has deceived us in the past, then it's oh. going to be more probable that he will in yeah. the future. So my answer to the third one is <coughs> meant to be an answer to the fourth one, too. So, uh, um, so just on the, the first and the third, then. So, um, so on the first, first point, uh, you brought up the repugnant conclusion. Yeah. Um, so could I run that argument backwards, then, against the young Arthur and say, so in your view, then, um, you should just be a solipsist and say that um, all of the, you're the only real being, and uh, everything else is just apparent evil that you can learn from. Um, and doesn't that seem to follow from the same kind of logic that uh, was motivating you to um, make the Young Earth hypothesis? Well, maybe it would, but then I'm going to say both the original argument that uh, I put in the mouth of the Young Earthers plus with my H2 plus the little <coughs> supplement I gave you then, that I thought, well, that, that argument isn't good for the reasons it introduces, you know, I don't know, immaterial beings that work mysteriously on the world and so on and so forth. So I thought that was the thing that made it a bad hypothesis. So I'd say, OK, here's another bad hypothesis. It has the same bad features that the young earthers hypothesis has. And it has the same bad feature. And the theistic hypothesis, the version one, ha also has the same bad features. So OK, they're all bad. The best hypothesis is there's a real external world. and uh, there is excessive unnecessary suffering. That's the simplest one. We all know. I, I don't have, see, last night I was arguing with you guys and offering a theory of what's the best explanation. I don't, that's a really hard question. I don't really know what, what makes some ex explanation exactly what it is that makes it better than another. But really, I decided on reflection that what I should say is the analogy is better than any theory. Everybody agrees that the Young Earth hypothesis is no good. And then why? Well, I think I've picked out why. And then I find them in all those competitors. And by analogy, condemn them epistemically. All right, well, I'll, I'll, I'll let other people uh, okay. ask questions at all. Uh, Stephen, did you want? Me? Yeah. Um, well, I think you're right. And, um, Wanting constraints on um, what you call saving hypotheses, Bruce. Uh, I think that your your article tends to uh, immediately invoke uh, disrespectable saving hypotheses. It doesn't uh, reflect very much on the type of strategies that I wouldn't call them saving hypotheses. I think that the sort of constructive research programs involve working out a theory into its best versions. Mm -hmm. So you, you end up versioning a theory. Yeah. And uh, that always involves adding specifying hypotheses and trying to 
uh, work within that tension between the falsified but still falsifiable. Yeah. So those all seem obvious mm -hmm. points. Um, mm -hmm. I don't see very much. So what Brian and I argued um, was that um, that what we need to do is look at constructive uh, ways, constructive versioning goes in science, and um, try to emulate that in theistic theory theorizing. Um, and it's going to involve a drawn out process of, uh, of, of trying out different types of hypotheses in some cases. Um, and I think the two most important constructive uh, strategies to use, um, you, one could illustrate them quickly with two examples. Um, one is the Copernican, say, uh, Copernican move, uh, where he has a heliocentric theory with some pretty impressive virtues empirically. But it has this problem, you know, about of no observed stellar parallax. So he proposes the stars are immensely farther away than the planets. And I suppose uh, at that point, one, um, apart from the theories, one had really good reason to believe that was false. Um, I say apart from the hypotheses. Um, if the Copernican uh, hypothesis had a lot going for it, then that would give Copernicus some reason to think, piggybacking on that, that this is true. Um, yeah, we have good reason to believe it's false, because they look pretty much the same. They're about the same degree of brightness. Uh, um, and so there you get a specifying hypothesis. And it um, is falsifiable and testable, and in the next 50, 100 years, it gets really important new evidence that it's true. So, but it takes time to do that. Um, the other case uh, is um, in the development of the kinetic theory, the gases are made of these little particles whizzing around about the speed of sound. Uh, people raise the problem, well, if uh, they're bouncing, if they're speeding around that long, why does it take so long if somebody uh, smokes a cigarette at one end of the hallway for us to smell the smoke down at the other end? Because it takes minutes. It's not like 600 miles an hour. And this was a real problem. It took a while to figure it out. And it led to um, Rudolf Clausius did it. And what he found out is if if the particles basically had the properties of theory attributed to them, though nobody realized it because they didn't think about it, they'd be bumping into each other enough so that a particle would Have kind of do a random walk very slowly, like um, uh, like walking through a Notre Dame football field after a big victory or something, trying to get to the other side. You know? Bouncing around. Yeah. yeah, even your best quarterback might take a while, right? And that's a case where, uh, so that's how we're thinking of it. Yeah. And we're really proposing um, a kind of, con a way of, uh, a mode of constructive theorizing that um, uh, seems to deserve us to deserve a chance, a, a kind of model of, of how to proceed as theists. So we're not just, I don't see, I don't see Ben Inwagen doing that in his, uh, for all we know, defenses. Those are kind of modeled on Planica-style deductive defenses, but they're against probabilistic versions. Um, so I would have, I think I would have appreciated, I felt like you you were kind of pushing in the Procrustean bed of those old styles. And um, the type of approach we're proposing is trying to do something different. And, chipping away at the examples we give one by one, well, it reminds us we need to go in that path that you mentioned, but I think we're pretty aware of that. That's not news to us. So yeah. I hope you'll engage the longer term project sometime. I say, you know, when I introduce the part about saving hypothesis, that I think it's the most reasonable path for theists to take. So I, I, I maybe didn't say this here, but I do say it in my paper, and I mean it. And so I said, I really think that all I have is a burden-shifting argument, because I said, the ones I considered I thought were falsifiable but false, that is justifiably false, 
and the other ones were unfalsifiable. But I admitted that there could be these hypotheses in somewhere that goes between the horns. So I don't know. I think I'm giving you everything you know that you're saying that that I agree with everything you said. However, the worry I have is that there's going to be something in those saving hypotheses always that's going to be comparable to what the young earthers say in their saving hypotheses and nobody thinks that the young earthers are justified in believing their theory. You've got to get that stuff, whatever it is, that makes us think the young earthers are not justified in believing their hypothesis out of yours. Because as long as you have that stuff in there, I'm going to say, well, Nice try, but then you're going to have to say that the young earthers are justified in believing the universe or Earth started 100 years ago. I'm not worried about that at all. Why? You haven't given us any reason except by treating one right after the other to think they're in the same boat. I thought I gave you the, the core theory, and then I gave you H2, which was a saving hypothesis, which I then quoted a theist as saying, Van Inwagen, that other things being equal, it would be better to have a dream world than a real world with the same amount of suffering that is dream real suffering. I quoted a theist to support H2, and then I considered whether there were other things that weren't equal. Some of the objections you and Perrine make about massive irregularity, and I addressed those. And, and there's the Van Inwagen one about massive deception that doesn't make it equal. And I addressed that. And so I said, other things are equal. What's the problem? <clears throat> What's wrong with that? I guess. Um, yeah. I'm not sure what to say exactly about the, the Earth one. I guess I want to say something more about uh, the Alston type of response here. That is, uh, in his response, I think it's very different from gremlinism and leprechaunism and so forth. Uh, he does say in the, um, in the article he writes there on final thoughts or whatever, on the evidential yeah. argument, he does say, okay, somebody might say, and I think Roe does say, that, you know, that we look around or we might look very thoroughly and we find no evidence of gremlins or whatever it is, then aren't we justified in believing there aren't any? Um, and that seems kind of plausible. Um, but what Alston says in response is that the territory of the world, as it were, the Earth anyway, is finite. And we kind of know where we should look kind of for gremlins. If we find somebody claiming to have seen them, all the people that claim that are here, let's see. And um, then we start looking around Notre Dame um, for them. And um, I thought you were going to say leprechauns, but you didn't. Well, leprechauns is also good, all right? <laughs> And um, you don't you don't catch sight of any, and people have all kinds of excuses for that and so on. But you know they're the kind of thing you could, in principle, see. So the fact that no one ever, no one else except this small group or whatever ever, ever claims, you start doubting whether they really, you know, know what they're talking about, whether there are such things. But also want to say, in the case of a divine being, plus you know infinitely um, has infinite more knowledge power and so forth and exists with necessity, exists throughout the duration of time and outside of it and so forth, then it's not as plausible to think that our survey of the territory of goods that there are is that comprehensive uh, a survey or that our understandings of the relationships between goods and evils or you know, suffering and goods, uh, there's not that much reason to think that we've sort of exhausted the territory there. Um, so, if you postulate a god that there is a god of this kind, then the suffering that seems unnecessary and so forth by itself doesn't necessarily count against God's existence. And, and I guess he would say the same about the gardener kind of examples and so forth. That I remember those very well. Yeah. Um, the gardening example that well, but we never see the gardener come in and tend it. So even though it looks kind of tended, after a while you think, well, I'm sorry. You know, there's absolutely no evidence. In fact, we put out all kinds of tests we still don't perceive. Um, Alston would say, I think, that none of the tests we could devise would enable us to know or have much confidence in thinking that, OK, well, now we've pretty much eliminated all the possible ways that, that God's um, excellence and so on would be detected. 
Um, he thinks we don't have any reason to think that we've exhausted them at all. So yeah. that's why, I mean, and I think, okay, well, how would you know that God has such reasons? Well, you wouldn't. Uh, but in the problem of evil, in a way, you're just you're on the defensive, as it were. You're, you're just saying God might have reasons like that. It wouldn't be crazy to think that, unlike maybe the flat earth thing or whatever. Um, it's not like it's not like you have to have a big justification in favor of it, but it can't be stupid or crazy or something we're not justified at all in thinking might be true, that kind of thing. So I sort of agree. I, in one way, I agree that a lot of these. Well, I do agree that a lot of the kind of excuses people throw out there, you might say positively, you know, we could expect this or that. I mean, this evolutionary account doesn't seem to me to be too helpful. I agree with your criticism there. I think a lot of them, yeah, don't work. This is one of the reasons why I thought, why I liked Alston's approach, because he didn't try to say what, he didn't try to say what those connections were. They seemed pretty hard, how would we know? So okay. I, I don't know, that's just a, th a thought. I wanted okay. to hear. So I have three responses. One is about, for all you know, I didn't make this point, but I meant to in my talk, that, that um, and Inwine uses this phrase, for all we know, these stories are true. And I think it's actually ambiguous. In one sense of for all we know, it means we don't know for certain their faults. Mm -hmm. And the other sense that I think is a more relevant one is uh, we're not justified in believing their mm -hmm. faults, because that one's relevant to whether it could be a saving hypothesis or not, because if we are justified in believing it's false, if I'm right about the general requirement, it can't be a saving hypothesis. And it doesn't matter really if we, for all we know means we don't know for certain, maybe we don't know for certain, but to me that's not the relevant sense, it's this weaker one about yeah. whether uh, we're justified in believing or, or well, not their faults. I take it that's Alston's view that we don't know we're not because the, it's a sort of, you know, the ones we've seen or yeah. the ones we can think of don't justify yeah. God, but you know that doesn't justify us in thinking that there aren't any yeah. such goods or reasons because I'm going to get back to all. Okay, you yeah. will. Okay, I'm, I'm going to get there. Right, go ahead. So that's that's my first. That's just to make a point about yeah. about I think the actually Van Inwagen equivocates here, right. so it's not clear yeah, which sense he's using, but right. the sense that he's entitled to use that for we don't know for certain their faults isn't the one that he really needs yeah, if he were going to use them as saving Good hypothesis. Point. I completely agree with Steve and I say in my paper and in the handout, which I don't think that was his intent, I don't think he intended that he was considering, as Steve said, some deductive argument. He told me, and it says in his book, that he just meant them as counterexamples. So I think he, he, he doesn't really put much stock in the difference between the evidential and the logical form of the problem of evil, but I think there is an important difference, and he was actually responding to what would be the logical, the logical problem of evil. So that's just a side. It's not completely the center of what you said, no, Laura. So I'm going to get to what you said. So there are two things I want to say to what you said. Uh, one is there are two problems I think you have. One is that everything you said, I think, could be used by the young earthers to defend their position. That after all, they both they believe in a god. The only difference is that they think the universe create was started a lot later than what we do. And so they're going to use every move you make that they, you know, there's this being who's infinite and, and you know necessary and has. Uh, more power and smarts than any human or any finite creature. And so, of course, he could have reasons beyond our ken for allowing, uh, uh, making the Earth look older than it uh, uh, really is. All the signs of age he puts there for real. We don't know, you know. And so the biggest problem, I think, is that any defense like the one that Alston uses is going to be able to, the young Earthers are going to be able to adapt it to their own position. And that is a bad thing, because you're still not going to believe young earthism is a justifiable theory. Second, the thing is it's not, a, of course, it's not as if we could have some empirical observations, which if we searched further, you know, might uh, disconfirm this. We might find some reasons. I don't know, somewhere we saw that this led to that, and it was a really good thing, you know? And so these things that we thought were excessive, unnecessary suffering, if we looked a little further, thought a little harder, we might actually see that they were necessary, or the allowing of them was necessary to bring about certain goods. So I don't deny that. It's just that it looks like the Gardner case. It looks like any kind of case that uh, we propose, this is excessive, unnecessary suffering, if they just say, but you're in no position to judge, of course, it's not empirical, but they're 
they're like the the gardener in the situation where we think that the evidence, the relevant evidence, is empirical. Here's what's similar. They will not let anything count against this view. You cannot show them. You cannot justify them in believing. Uh, you cannot claim you're justified in believing there's excessive unnecessary suffering, because they're always going to introduce these things you're ignorant of to show that you couldn't possibly be justified in believing that. So it's only a similarity between the gardener and this case. It's not empirical. But that similarity is what I think is crucial. The other point was that I think the young earthers are going to be able to run every defense you give and defend their view. I don't know. Oh, sorry. You're going. Um, so uh, you, you talked about um, flus use of wisdom's parable. Yeah. And you talked about Mitchell's response. Yeah. But you didn't talk about Hare's response. I was going to let you do that. No, I, I didn't. Uh, and he thinks they're blicks. So uh, what he does is he, he, he gives a, a form of Kant's argument. Uh -huh. And in fact, he's explicit about that. Uh, a moral argument. Uh, and he, he takes the whole discussion from the domain of theoretical reason into the domain of practical reason in the same way that Kant does. Now, your objections about young earth have all been within the domain of theoretical reason. And I think you should consider seriously the Hare response uh, to the gardener. So, so help me, John, remind me, because I did read it recently, but I didn't focus on that one. Yeah. So the, the practical response, the Kantian one, I take it is that if people hold these, these uh, views, he calls them blicks rather than beliefs, because he wants to distinguish there's certain differences between, they will hold these blicks, I'll say beliefs, uh, come what may. And the thing that recommends them, I take it, is that if you do, somehow things or your life will go better. Am I? Am I no, that's, that's not the OK, right. what, what is the reason? What's the practical reason? Uh, so the, the, it, it does matter what you call them, I mean, the, the, okay. whether you call them beliefs or beliefs. Uh, because it, it, it's not a belief. Um, of, an, of an ordinary theoretical kind. It's a commitment. Uh, it, it, it's more like what Kant would call Glaube. Uh, uh, that uh, the world is run in a certain way so that it's worthwhile, it makes sense, to try to be morally good. Uh, so you're not starting from empirical evidence. You're starting from some kind of commitment to the moral law. And then you ask, what could justify that? What, what, what could make sense of that? And it is this blick. Uh, that there, he, what he does is he quotes from the psalm that, that the earth is weak and all the inhabitants thereof, and God bears up the pillars of it. That's the blick. I, yeah. OK, so I don't know. I, this isn't a fight I really want to continue much. The part of, but part of it I do. But part of it about, look, if it's, a, as, if it's a mental attitude with a proposition as its object, and it's not a seeming, it's a belief. OK, forget about that. We'll call it a blick. Yeah. I don't still see what the pragmatic justification for holding this blick is. You blick that the world is a kind of place with such and such a nature, I guess, and it, and if you and therefore what it's good, it's good to live according to this blick. I don't. I can't quite get the practical argument yet. I mean, help me. What is so, it? You, you start with some kind of commitment to the moral law. Okay. So it's not pragmatic. In if you in mean the kind of Pascal's wager, it's not the Pascal's no, wager. Not, it's not that sort of argument at all. Okay, I'm um, committed to these moral, the yeah. not treating people as mere means. So. Yeah, and now you ask, what has to be the case uh, about the world? About or? the world, 
if I'm going to support that uh, uh, belief, if I'm going to live by it. And, uh, huh. uh, well, I've seen my father said, j just, just as Kant said, uh, providence. You have to have some kind of be belief in a providential order. Huh. Well, first, of course, you know how I go about somebody who offers me one of these blicks. I, I like, like Parfit, think, is there a counterexample to it? And then I think, oh, yeah, there is. There's a counterexample about, about the, uh, the egoist who saves the child only for his own riches. So I don't, I don't know if hold this blick anymore. Let's see if you got another blick that I hold. Uh, I don't hold the harmful means principle. I think of Alistair's example. I think of the fat man in the cave example. I don't hold that. The only reason I hold any blicks in the world is because I can't think of any counterexamples to them, and they seem intuitively obvious on their face. It's all theoretical to me. What, what difference does it make whether the proposition is about how you should act, what you should do, what you know, whether A causes B? All of those things to me are completely, whether I should accept them or not, are completely a function of theoretical reason, and then, including intuition, not empirical reason. And then after that, if I have normative claims either about actions or beliefs, I try to adhere to them. And I, what do I say about, I think they imply nothing metaphysical. I think that if I shouldn't treat people as mere means, I don't care whether there's a god or not. That means that reason requires me to do it. And insofar as, insofar as I'm a reasonable being, I should treat, not treat people as mere means. I never get this stuff. I never get how any of these things are not really at bottom theoretical claims about practical matters. And I don't get why I'd have to have any particular metaphysics to make me uh, have reason to act accordingly or to live in a certain kind of life. Are there truths? Aren't there truths about how you should live? They're like math to me. It's all math. They're just these truths, and we've got to discover them about how you should act, what you should believe, and the like. I don't know. That's why I don't think that this Kantian has any pragmatic argument that's not basically, at bottom, theoretical. I think I, I, don't, I mean I've already given my my, yeah. my, my arguments yesterday, okay. but I I, I I think you're just uh, uh, choosing to call beliefs about or, or commitments to what, how we ought to act in the world. You, you, you're 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 choosing to call them theoretical and to ignore then a, a fundamental distinction because uh, they have to stand up to their content is not. It's not A causes B, that's not theoretical, but their content about you're justified in believing this or justified in doing this or you should live like that, their content is practical, but they're theoretical in the sense that they're, the justified acceptance of them is a function of evidence. I guess that's the difference between Kant and me and you, maybe. Can I just follow up on that? What would you say, Bruce, about like a scientist's commitment to um, the universe being intelligible? So, um, you know, we re scientists regularly find this these unsolved problems. You know, why is the universe expanding at the rate it is? It should be going faster. You have to look to a lot for a long time for answers. They say, oh, maybe it's some sort of matter. Oh, well, we can't see it. Oh, well, let's call it dark matter. Yeah. Uh, we can't smell it. I mean, they don't say that, but it's sort of in the vicinity <laughs> of the gardener. Um, Put tripwires up. And, and this happens over and over again. There's this passionate um, um, belief that informs this um, persistent search for explanations. Yeah, they're true. They, 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 there are these, and sometimes we have these beliefs about our children or our loved ones or something that they couldn't have done that. You know, they're honest people. But just about this one. OK, I'll come back to it. Uh, so my answer is there are lots of these beliefs, or what you want to call them, blicks, 
And a lot of, there are similar ones with different content. And I don't think any of us respect them. We think, look, I'm a racist, and I believe whites are superior. And there's nothing you're going to be able to. That's, that guides my inquiry. I read all these books, and I do, I do research, and I look. I test the kids in the ghetto, and they do worse than the people in the, the whites in the suburbs. And I say, look, there's more information. There's more evidence. And I, you discount it, and I still, it guides my research. I'm not getting this example, Bruce. It feels a little like ranting. The, the point. You come back to the. The point is, deep, look, yes, because the point is, the either the intelligibility thing is like that, and then I say, so what? It's true. People have these commitments, or it's not. And if it's not, it's because they've had a lot of success in finding that things were, that were thought to be unintelligible actually are. So they actually have inductive support for this, what may have originated like the racist blick that I compared it to, but it now has a different status. And if it had the same status as the racist blick, we should discount it. Should we have discounted in the beginning? I mean, it seems like there's, it seems like there's passionately held licks, and maybe some of them are good and some of them are bad. Um, there, it would never have been confirmed to the extent it has if it hadn't been held in a passionate yeah. way. It's, that was it's, a good thing. It's I don't know that you're, you compare it with a pretty discreditable one, I guess. It's epistemically permissible, I think, to start with blicks or hypotheses that haven't been falsified. It's epistemically permissible. But as, as evidence mounts, and it looks like the racist type blick or whatever has been discounted, you should give it up. But the one about intelligibility, has not. there's not evidence against that one. But my worry is that the theistic hypothesis is like the Gardner hypothesis in Flew's analogy. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's go back to the, I guess it's the, the Young Earthers book. Uh, so when I raised the issue about, I mean, you're offering this to the theist in some senses, you know, it's on a par with your book. Uh, and then when I brought up the idea of, well, you've got a problem with uh, the doctrine here, and then you shifted, well, now it's young earthers who are non-Christian theists. Um, then, but now what, what, are these, what are we supposed to be thinking here? They're thinking these young earthers who are non-Christian theists see Christianity in the history, this imaginist Greek triumphing and all this, and, and, and how is this good? I mean, what was supposed to happen here now? Well, who, I mean, I'm just trying to get, you know, whose point of view is this, that yeah. this is now looked at, and this is a really better world than our world. Um, uh, can you give me, help me up a little bit? Well, so it's better mainly because it doesn't have real suffering. And now what about the other parts you're asking? Well, well uh, it, it uh, it, it it has it it, has, it doesn't have the real suffering. Um, now, if you, but it has it's it's got this whole it, it, Christianity is is thought. Are, who, are we thinking it's true? Uh, these the young earthers are thinking Christianity is true. But they're not thinking it's true. No. They they're, they're thinking there's this deception that they know or they think I don't know why uh, that is all false and, and it's running through the world, Christianity. Um, and they and um, but they think a lot of lessons could be learned from the Christian story as atheists could. Yeah, God taught us something about love and its importance, and it's independent of whether there's a God and resurrection and all that, and it's true. So now they got all these false stories that, are, that they, they they're, they're they're going on all all these all these theodicy, or theologies that are that are all in the world and they're all false. 
I mean, except theirs. They're full. Well, what, 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 what is the, what's the content of theirs? I mean, they're theists. They're theists because they think there's a God who. I, I know, created. but 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 um, uh, is there any historical part of the of the back past that they're they're tying onto, or is it, they just no real? They, they just a deist like, or what? Are they, what happened? Where do they where do they get there? They think that God created the earth with all the signs of age and all the natural laws that we have a hundred years ago. Say. And, and he's not connected to any of these historical traditions. No, he's not. No, he just told this story, which, like I said. Uh, uh, during my talk, he told this story, no, in response actually to Nevin, that he told this story like people will, t will write novels and fictions so people could learn some lessons from these stories as we can from reading fiction. So the whole, um, the whole religious past is just some novel. Um, uh, it's not, I mean, uh, what, I, what I thought was happening with the, the historical past was that we learn from how, you know, the, well, the story, the story about how countries go to war and how, or, and we learn from how the horrors of war, you, you have this, you think it all happened, you learn how to avoid war, you learn also so many truths out of all this because this is, you know, this is human experience they've learned through this. Well, they know it's not experience, but it's like that. It's like that. But now you've got this religious stuff that's going on without any basis whatsoever. Just, what do you mean just, by just, that? just, just, just concocted stories, which have no. Well, it's unclear how they're connected up with the human good. Well, because ultimately, the, he grants the young Earther. He grants that. It is a good thing ultimately for people to come into existence because I, I quoted the, the Jim Pryor note about, uh, he says about people in the matrix, why we wouldn't want to be in the matrix because we wouldn't have real freedom. And they say well, we wouldn't have real freedom if there weren't anybody, so we eventually need real freedom. But it's better to have this kind of learning from a story when you get freedom than to have it way back here where you wouldn't have all of this knowledge that you could benefit by. So of course there's also a reason some, at some point for God to create uh, creatures that will develop into people. Or, no, in this case, the creature creates them actually full blown. Because yeah, it's a good I, thing to have freedom. Yeah, I, I don't know why these stories are any way useful since they, um, they're, they're just totally false. Uh, right. What are they telling? I mean, they're, they're not telling us anything about about God, uh, right? You're telling about what, how to, what's a good, better, and a worse way to live, and how how to behave. Can't fictional stories? Are they, are they, are they telling us anything about God? Uh, we we is. already believe that God is all knowing, all powerful, and holy good. And, and we so we and, and they're illustrating that. And they're, and they're saying how what would be a best way for Him to create a universe, and here's the alternative, stand contrary to the standard view. Yeah. Do they take the stories to be the way they take the rocks? I mean, I take it the rocks with appearance of age and a Grand Canyon that looks like it was carved. They say, that didn't really happen. We shouldn't believe it happens. It's just there is a temptation to see if we have real faith. Are that they that sort with the rocks? No, they say, oh, he was trying to impart to us before we actually experience the world, what would happen if you have a river running through a place for a long time? You'll get a big valley. Why do we have to have any beliefs about dinosaurs? <laughs> I can't explain <laughs> 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 every bit of this story. <laughs> <laughs> but but <neither> can, <laughs> what also, what also it's no worse than the answer is than the theist who can't explain well why we, we ask them, well why is there so much suffering? Well, oh, they could I just give us novels with the same plots as the religious texts. What's that? Sorry. They could just give us novels with the same plots as the religious texts, so that we wouldn't be deceived, but we would still have the same stories. Novels with the same actual reality? Yeah, yeah novel, the Bible, written by Dostoevsky. Yeah. And then we could just read the novel. We could just be happy there. We could. We would be, we would be deceived. But this way is also, you know, you get to learn things about the natural world as well yeah. as about the. Human world. You know, on the deception thing, you know, deception <laughs> is sort of appropriate when you're dealing with bad people. Uh, you know, deceiving a lot of good people, uh, 
it looks, it looks like a really worse thing to do. And for what purpose? I mean, so, 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 so that, I don't know, because we don't, so we don't have to go through the history of having a lot of people suffer, and some people be saved and whatever else. So we, we um, but, but, you, but, but all those good people, all, all the people that, that, that had pleasure and happiness, they're not there either. The suffering is not there, but, the, but I mean, it is, it, that's not part of the past either. The good, all the good. All that good is not there. It's just a big one. But it's really a bad thing to let a little girl suffer. And that's not there. Right. And a bunch of millions of those cases. Right. Just, just one last thing. Could you, could you go back to why if the, um, uh, these principles never do evil and, and, and the ends just are, are, are now, um, uh, have no uh, comparable exceptions for God, that we, that, that our reasons for, for exceptions are, are based on our power. So oh. there's no comparable. Why that's not a, that, that doesn't have some bite? Oh, I was going to say that I see that, you know, somebody might say, well, there are only exceptions to the using people as a mere means or the Pauline people for finite beings. Suppose there are no exceptions for God. Then I just said that, well, then the theist will not attack the moral part. He'll just say then, but then why are you justified in believing that these people has been uh, used as mere means, maybe they're not used as mere means. Well, there... um, it, it, it looked, uh, you, 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 were, you, were, you were permitting evil to good may come of it. Yeah. Uh, that was the description of what was going on. Yeah, that's. that's uh, it was hard to think that wasn't. Uh, and now, if you say, well, that's not. You, you're not really using people here as means, um, um, uh, or you're you're not really violating the Pauline principle of never doing evil with a couple. What are you doing? Um, yeah, because they might say that they're. You know, we can't get it, but there may be that it's actually good for the little girl to suffer this way. I was somebody was suggesting to me maybe. Uh, uh, Eleanor Stump and, and, and Marilyn Adams, is that right, Evan? Might say that, and so Swinburne we kind of think that that's, that. huh? Swinburne thinks that. Swinburne it's thinks that. It's not wholly bad to suffer so that someone else might be I, free. Yeah, that's right. But, but that's still doing. It's not, not wholly bad for, for you. you. That's right. For, it's good for I mean, you that doesn't you. compute with me, but I mean, you know, somebody might say, well, that's just because you don't really understand <laughs> things as well as God, and so. That, that approach would be to say they're not really used as mere means. They are suffering. But it's actually not all in all for their bad. Well, well that's it. The, the good is the good. They're, they're being treated badly. But yeah. then they're, they're going to be some good. The good for them. is coming later. It's coming to them. Yeah. No, no, but coming uh, to later. Truth, it doesn't come later. It's oh, that's true. It comes now. He thinks it's now. a good thing. But I wonder if he thinks it's only a good thing. It's, it's, only good a, it's not holy. It's, it's not holy. So, so even if somebody replied, well, it's a good, granted for the sake of it, it's a good thing, but still it's not good enough. And then the response to that one is, well, maybe there is some more good enough that comes to you in the afterlife. Is this afterlife. part of being assaulted? There, it, there's a good thing in your assault, being assaulted? I mean, what's the, what's the I don't know. Quite You'll have to read. <laughs> yes, that's the view. It, He's I, right. Incredible as it may seem. This is Swinburne. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and, and, and which, that's a Providence one. I it's reviewed that book, book, actually. Yeah, okay. that's right. You reminded me, actually. Okay. Uh, Meg's been very patient. Very patient. That's a virtue. A <laughs> well, I guess I'm just having trouble kind of understanding the structure of the argument a little bit. Okay. Um, so I'm wondering if it seems like it's something like, look, if you accept skeptical theism, you're going to have this bad problem. You're going to be stuck accepting, like, not having a response to the young earthers. Right. But it just seems like I can accept, accept skeptical theism and just reply to the young earthers by saying, look, theism, the content of theism doesn't commit us to thinking that the, earl, the world is only 7,000 years old or whatever you say it is. It um, and then it seems like you yeah. have all sorts of resources to reply to them. But the idea is that the skeptical theist wants to argue, well, the atheist is no, in no position epistemically to, to reject their view. And it's just then the analogy that the young earthers say that for the very same reasons you skeptical theists say that, that uh, naysayers are in no position to reject your view, 
naysayers to our young Earth view, the, uh, the uh, opponents are in no position to reject it either. And I was taking that as a reductio, that we are in a position to reject uh, young Earthism. And so if that's right, then, then the same thing should apply to the skeptical theist position. It's not the particular content of, like theism isn't committed to, to the content that young Earthism is. But if they make the same move, the basic one, without giving the specific hypothesis, the skeptical theist says to the atheist, you, uh, you're, there are reasons beyond your ken, and so you're no position to assert, say, that there's excessive unnecessary suffering. And the young earthers say, there are reasons beyond our ken, so we're in no position to reject young earthism that says the earth is, I don't know, 100 years old. So it's, it's saying that the beyond your ken move that you skeptical theists try uh, is also going to be able to be used by us, but reductio, everybody thinks it's not really a good move to save young earthism, so how could it be any better a move to save skeptical theism? Yeah? What, um, what is the parallel claim? I mean, in the theist move, I see two possible claims. Um, but I took the initial one to be um, you're trying to give a reductio of Alston. And Alston, Alston doesn't say there's no reasons, there's reasons to be beyond your ken. Therefore, you can't say what you want to say, Bruce. What you want to say is um, there isn't any outweighing good. And what Alston wants to say is, if there were outweighing goods of the sort you're talking about, uh, you wouldn't be in a position to see them, right? Yeah. I mean, it's it's something like that. It's not just the ball claim there are outweighing goods. Yeah, yeah. It's more, <coughs> and so what is it ex more exactly? Because I said I actually didn't say that there were outweighing goods. I said that there were three parts of your version of the defense, and you'd have to be justified in believing uh, you or Alston say, you can say if I'm wrong about this, for you, but justified in believing three things, not just that it, they're true, but justified in believing that there uh, are, aren't any goods or bads beyond those we're aware of, that uh, you're justified in believing that we know how to weigh them, and justified in believing that we know how they're connected. But, but you're not. If you can't be justified in believing any of those things, then you can't be justified in asserting their is excessive, unnecessary suffering. Right, OK, and so what's? So then I say that the young earthers use a similar thing, that you can't be justified in believing all of those things for the young earthers. And so you're not justified in believing that there are no reasons God has for making the earth world look a lot older than it really is. So you're not justified in rejecting young earthism. Reductio. Yeah. I really need to see those claims like in a column so I can get my mind around them. They just kind of swim around in my mental okay. vision. So. Let, me count it, let me get another way. Um, Fred Mamoa, who taught the philosophy of science here for years, was always trying to keep faith and, 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 uh, and science together. And so you might want to think that the way we should be coming at this issue is we're going to accept science. It's common ground here. Okay. And now we're going to see what faith is compatible with that. If, and, um, and that's, if we go there, the young earth is off the table. It's gone. And that seems to be not a bad way to come at this. Because another way of thinking about this is we don't really want to say, you know, we, we just know there is a God. and. Um, and it's totally independent of everything else we know. No, no. You know, we know something about goodness in the world. And, and because we know something about goodness in the world, we postulate then maybe a, a good God. And, and if we didn't know anything about goodness in the world, we would we'd be theism. Oh, well, what does it look like? You know, so we got to start somewhere. And one of the places, a nice place, I, I like this, starting with science. And, and that's common ground here. And, and now, 
let's let's have a discussion go forward. And expanding on that point, a lot of the reasons that one might have for being a theist in the first place would presuppose that um, science is accurate. They'd be things like um, like a teleological argument, fine-tuning argument, or if you have an argument from historical evidence for miracles, that supposes that the Earth is um, old enough that uh, it actually that those miracle reports actually happened. Um, so it seems that this would undercut like a lot of the reasons one would have for being a theist in the first place. You mean the... The Young Earth Hypothesis. Uh, maybe so. <laughs> but my view is going to be about, it's OK. Let's suppose we start there. We suppo suppose that theism is compatible. Isn't that what you want me to assume? We're, we're, consistent we're gonna, we're gonna, with... We're going to try for that. That's right, let's start, that's start there. If science, if science disproves yeah. theism, uh, then we're, we're in trouble. Yeah. Uh, but, but we're going to start with science, yeah. and we're going to run with that. Right. That's our common ground. Okay so, okay, so now we have... Suppose... I think this is actually true. I remember Planica giving this talk in Croatia where I was, and I said... And he was arguing that science and religion or Christianity are compatible. And, and one of the commentators who was a friend of mine was arguing that it wasn't. And I said, hey, I don't get that. I think it's completely compatible. I mean, there's no inconsistency. God just made the world with all the laws and matter in it. I mean, come on, what's the trouble? But then, of course, I thought, and I said, there's a plan of guy. I said, well, you know, you and I think it's compatible, but we differ after that. So why? So I think, huh, but it's not just, you know, what's happening in the world according to the laws of nature and so on and so forth, but it's this special thing, all this suffering, that that's the one that's kind of a kicker, that now we have to wonder what should, which should we think about it. Right. And then that, that brings us now beyond the way that, that theism could perfectly explain why the world is actually the way it is and there's the laws of nature we keep you know, revealing God's work, and I don't know, it sounds perfectly fine to me. And then, oh, shit, <laughs> suffering comes along, suffering you know? And now we have new evidence. You know, it's like I, I don't think I did this, but I was talking to some people about, uh, did I do Steve's Pollyanna uh, case that Polly is, has this shallow form of theism or naive theism, or I don't know, I don't mean to be insulting to Polly, but this, whatever term's appropriate to, and she thinks that basically God's purposes are pretty much at the surface, that you know, and you can't see them right away, but if you reflect it a little bit, you could see why that uh, he allows this suffering for this good or things like that. And then, then that nasty uh, Artsky, who's I think Steve's young alter ego, comes along and tells her about all this terrible suffering beyond anything he says that she could imagine before talking to him. And so now she thinks, oh my god, I can't, that naive theism doesn't seem to work. And so now I have, now I have deep theism. And deep theism is a versioning of core theism plus saving hypothesis. And now we're into my discussion. Right. And so then I say, OK, let's see, what are these hypotheses? Well, you might think it's unfair that I use Van Inwagen's hypotheses, they weren't hypotheses, but little stories, in order to turn them into things he didn't intend, namely saving hypotheses. Come on, that's cheating, Bruce. Yeah, 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 yeah. But the only reason I did that is because, because Steve and Perrine didn't really give their candidates. They just said two things. They said, well, there is something about the fallenness of nature, the depravity of man, and the importance of free will, et cetera. So I thought, oh, those are in the ballpark of those. And then they gave this other, you might call, Laura used this term earlier today about negative theodicy. And then they gave this other story about why we're in no position to judge. You know, So I just went with those two and said, on the one hand, that's a representative sample. You don't like it. OK, give me one in the middle. That we're, we're not justified in believing those. And the other one, the negative theodicy, is like the Gardner hypothesis. But so then it, the beat went on. But the skeptical <laughs> hypothesis is not counter science in any way. No. And, and it's true that in Wagner's thing, it got, it got messy at certain points. And so if you really want to do this correctly, you'd have to clean up an in Wagner story. It shouldn't be counter evolution. So you fix it up. And, and, he, and he might have some immoral problems in there. I mean, so, so fix it up more out morally. And then see, now, and then see what we've got. That's the game. He talks about it. He has well, a footnote and says, I don't know why he says it. You might think that rationality evolved naturally, you know, but I think 
there's le the least problem is in the view that there was a miraculous occurrence of it. Now, I don't know why he says this. He yeah. says it. Yeah. But OK. Yeah. You know, I, I was reading an account of, of, of Holocaust reports that people, that, you know, and it, it, I'm learning something very interesting about what it was like in concentration camps. And it's, it's just mind boggling. I thought horror after horror. It's not clear that was the experience. That there was a, when people got into aspects of survival, their, their days were different. The, the kind of experience they had was quite different than anything I would have imagined. I thought they were suffering all the time. No, they weren't. There's something else going on there. The, the goals of, of maneuvering and, and surviving in, the, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a concentration camp uh, created pro meaning problems uh, of, uh, that people solved. And, and great heroism was, was achieved. So, I mean, the, the story of how this, how to understand suffering and evil and everything is, is a complicated one. But I think we should, we should really explore it and see if it's compatible with all good God. But, but, but keep, keep, keep science as the, the, the basis of the background here so we don't get into too, too many kind of games. So you know, Jim, that I said to you, when you asked that question and didn't sort of ask another question, I said, of course. Do you, don't you think that theism is compatible with science? Absolutely. I, could, I told the story about Flanagan, Croatia, that I couldn't understand why my friend was denying what he was saying. Well, I'm and not sure it is compatible yet. I mean, I mean, there could be some problems with, you know, with, uh, with the cosmology here. I, I mean, I think it's, the story is, is, is still out. Uh, but, I, but I think we should pursue it. Uh, pursue what? Pursue see where <laughs> there is compatibility or not. I mean, I mean, you know, scientists talk about a, 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 fine, a real explanation for the universe. And, 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 and some of that explanation seems godless, at least the, 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 some, some theories of it. So I, I mean, I think the question about whether uh, science is, is going to be compatible with theism or not is still open. Um, I, I don't think it speaks to the issue about is there excessive unnecessary no, suffering. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. But now, then they go here. Well, how are we going to speak to that question? And I think what you have to speak to it and is with morality. How's that going to help? And we have to do a moral evaluation of suffering and the world and see if that's compatible with an all good God. So you think that maybe if you looked into morality, you'd say maybe the principle about not using people as mere means and the Pauline principle are both have exceptions, not only on my own examples, we're only with finite beings, but also with infinite beings. I mean, that would well, be a way. Maybe, what? and we have to look at that. Well, you can try. I mean, there are a lot, know, of, lot of ways to reconcile. I, I mean, that's, that's the game I, I'm suggesting. I, I, it's, a, it's just an alternative game, but I, I, I worry about the game that sort of you know, throws science out the window and, and, and starts to do But my view doesn't. Well, it does in the terms of the alternatives you're, you're proposing. See, the, the, the skeptical theist hypothesis is not counter science, yeah. but, but yours are. But I only use mine to illustrate something about bad explanations. I just want to say, get you to agree that the young earther's explanation is bad. And I only use it for that purpose. I don't really subscribe to it. But then I say, ah, it's bad. And doesn't it have the very same features that, this, that the hypothesis, the saving hypothesis that the skeptical theist wants to offer have. But that's see when you when you said that, I mean, it seems to me it doesn't. It doesn't because what's wrong with the, the, the young Earth and the creationist thing is that they're counter science. And and what's not it's not true that skeptical theism is counter science. But the reason that we think it's bad is because it's counter science. But the reason we think it's bad is because we think science is a better explanation. Yes. But the contrast that I'm drawing with the young earth hypothesis is there's a bad explanation for, the, f for what we have observed in a broad sense, and there's a good one. And what's the difference? We only go for science because we think it's the best explanation of the age of the universe. Right. That's where it gets its, its uh, 
merit. Right. And then we think, huh, what about the other one? It's not just because something is counter science. It's because of its particular nature. That is, it has features in its explanation that make it bad relative to the scientific one. And those very same features that make it a bad explanation appear in the, in the theistic saving hypotheses. Well, I think Jim, this I think, is... I think, I think okay, I'll just wrap up. Thank you, Nevis. I've been trying... <laughs> 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 Polite, I mean. but, yeah, I think we should stop. Go ahead. Thank you very much.